So a word of warning, the, the Saab 93 is, is JJ's kind of car. So there may be a little bit of bias in this review, but I'm gonna try and do my best to review this car properly, but I bloody love a Saab. And this, this Saab 93, which is the, the very last of the mid-sized compact saloons that Saab ever made. And they sold it for 10 years from 2002 up until 2012. I used to actually own one of these a few years back, a very similar car to this. So it's an absolute pleasure to get back behind the wheel of it. I, I really love this dashboard. The, the Saab thing is that they designed it based on like the jet fighter that Saab also make. And it's like, it's supposed to look a bit like a jet fighter, which I actually think it kind of does. All this use of like multi-layered instruments. So you've got like the, the Saab information display up at the top, and then you've got just this massive panel of buttons, um, upright panel of buttons in front of you. And all the, all the font is green on black, and that is very much a jet fighter thing. It just feels like a, a very different and unique car right from the beginning. The journalists at the time, they would be very keen to tell you that this car is based on the Vauxhall Vectra or Opel Vectra. But in my opinion, that that's, basically irrelevant. The Vectra is a, a fine car to begin with anyway. It doesn't actually matter. Nobody cares now that their Audi is, is the same chassis underneath as a Skoda or a Seat. And it really is like full of little Saabi quirks um, and features. They begin with the obvious ones like the absolute crazy cup holder situation. The absolute work of art that comes out of the dashboard. It folds out like a, a folding uh, flower or butterfly. You've got the night panel which in the dark basically shuts off all of the dials except for the speedometer. I'm actually going into a tunnel now so I can uh, maybe try it out. Oh uh, yeah. I don't know how much use that actually is. I mean, when I had mine, on a long journey back at night, I would find myself putting that on. You know, it did just kind of take the distractions away and it let you focus. You could pretend you were like a Swedish jet fighter pilot or whatever if you wanted to. Beyond that, you've got the fact that the ignition key is down here in the centre console, which is to do with security reasons, I think, for like locking the gearbox and stuff. So not only did you have like a steering lock, but you've got a gearbox lock as well. The official reason is safety, to stop the key injuring your knee in a collision. The anti-whiplash seats, which are incredibly comfortable, but you've also got this weird shaped headrest here, and that's always been a, an, been a Saab thing, that. So what's it like to, to drive? Well, with this auto box and this very sort of relaxed steering, should we say, it's not sharp. Um, there's a lot of play around the, the middle. Like I can do this and I'm not, the car's not steering much. Around town, it's dead easy to drive. It's got like old school hydraulic steering, so it's heavy-ish. You've got pretty good visibility because it's not um, a super modern car. So you've got relatively narrow A pillars, nice big wing mirrors. It feels nice, uh, open and spacious and, and airy. But I think it's because I've got the seat reasonably far back, but my elbow doesn't quite fit properly on this armrest, which is a shame. It's just on the very edge of it. But it's got some nice padded material, so I think with shorter legs you could get your arm on there for relaxing. Oh, and while I'm here, uh, the other Saab quirk in this 9.3 is the sort of hidden handbrake, which you can't actually really see that it's there until it's on, and it's a really nice little feature. I've got these three extremely clear dials, just three circles. You've got your fuel and your temperature, your revs in this little dial here, and then your speed, and it's just all very clear and easy to, to understand. The other good thing about this dashboard is these, these climate vents, which are just infinitely adjustable to any position you like. The 9.3 was never really quite up to the, the same quality and standards as the equivalent BMW or Mercedes, but it certainly was a match for Volvos and Hondas and, and, and the sort of mid-level exec cars. It, it does feel in many ways, it feels like a quality product, like the door, when you shut the door, it does feel really solid. Just listen to this door shut. Oh yeah. The car was a, a five-star Euro NCAP. Uh, one of the very first after the Renault Laguna, it was one of the very first five-star safety rated cars. But then in other ways it feels, you know, some of the plastics they use, like the door handle, it's, I don't know if you can hear that, but it's, it's very like a, a creaky kind of plastic. The badges on the exterior seem to be made of phyllo pastry because they just seem to all flake away. To be honest, all that is forgiven because it's a super comfortable car to drive. The seats are really, really nice and supportive and they hold you in as well. 
when you're doing speed in this car, you hardly know you're doing it. The same with the one I had, you could be doing silly speeds and you wouldn't quite realise you'd done it. Not that that's really an excuse to the officer when he pulls you over. Sorry officer, I'm in a Saab, I didn't know. But they are like a, just a very relaxing, I mean this particular car has got the automatic gearbox. You could get it with a five or six speed manual or this six speed auto or a five speed auto and it's dead smooth, it suits the car quite well actually. Now, although this car is ostensibly like a sports saloon car, it was always very much a oh, CLK, more of a sort of motorway cruiser than a, a sports car. There's, there's a couple of little creaks in here, but there's nothing that's like really annoying me. It's on some old cars you get one particular persistent creaky noise and, and it'll do your head in. This car's done 110,000 miles. I mean, it's actually low mileage for this car's age. It's a 2006. This model's the four-door saloon. It's the bread and butter 9.3. From 2004 they did the convertible, which is actually still a very desirable car. It had an electrically operated folding roof with a triple layer insulation, so it was a very, very um, refined and comfortable convertible that looked good as well. They also introduced the Sport Combi, or estate car to me and you. That came out in 2005 and initially when I first saw that car I wasn't a big fan of, of the way it looks, especially the rear end, but it's grown on me over the years. They did come with loads and loads of engine options and they were all quick. One or two rare options that were not very fast, like the 1.8 litre petrol that not that many people bought. The rest were like two litre turbo petrols with various powers. The 1.8 small T, which was still quite a fast car with 150 horsepower. Then you get the two litre small T and then the two litre big T, which was the 210 brake horsepower that usually came with the aero trim package. That was a quick car. Then they did the 2.8 litre petrol, which was the car I had, which was a V6 turbocharged engine, similar to the Vauxhall engine that, that was in the Vectra. It was an absolute barnstormer. It was a, a real speed machine, particularly when you were going at higher speeds. Not 60 was like, like six point something, but when you were doing motorway speeds, you put your foot down and you were doing crazy license losing speeds before you even knew it. Then you had a load of diesel options, all 1.9 litre diesel. This car is right bang in the middle of all of the sort of available diesel engines that you could get. This has 150 horsepower and it's perfectly adequate. In 2008, they introduced the twin turbo TTID 1.9 diesel engine and that had a, tw a twin stage turbo, so it had the small turbo and a big one. So you didn't get that lag and it was a, a very smooth and powerful engine. I liked how Saab used to do their trim levels. You had the Linear, which was the lowest spec car, which they all came with like four times electric windows, climate control and so on. The two levels above Linear, which were Arc, and Vector. Arc was like your sort of luxury focused one which had like fake wood, a bit like Mercedes Elegance. And then you had Vector which was like the sporty trim level which is what this car is and everything's grey and silver and black and it's it's got that sporty look to it. There was one more trim level and that was the highest trim level which was Aero and that basically came with the high performance engines like the 2 litre Big T Turbo and the uh, 2.8 and that had like uh, all the bells and whistles. Here's, a, here's a, something I like about this, and I remember it from mine. The noise of the indicator, it actually comes through the speakers. It's quite weird when you first hear it, but it's really nice. I'm just gonna test out the fat bottom bottle in, oh no. Well, I wouldn't like to really put it in there anyway, because this is quite a heavy bottle and it might snap off. It certainly fits in the cup holders in the back, which pop out. It doesn't fit in the door pockets. They're really small, actually. Yeah, no chance in there, but decent big glove box. And then a couple of little cubby holes, one here in front, behind the transmission. Okay, so it's that time in the video where we're going to uh, hand over to backseat JJ and see what he thinks of the back of the Saab 9.3. What, what's that? Oh, this, mate. Uh, yeah, I've been, uh, I've, I'm thinking of starting a degree in architecture because I thought, well, we're in this Saab, you know, and we've got our turtlenecks on. The next thing is to just draw out some blueprints and, uh, you know, I can send them off to local architect uh, school. Uh, there you go. Oh, <laughs> oh, that's really good, man. Um, yeah, I'm going to... Uh, Put that on the fridge. Can you tell us about the back now though please? Well back here it's it's just about enough for me to sit behind JJ. I'm pretty tight for legroom but but I can fit. There's enough headroom as well. So climate vents on the back of the center console. A nice armrest here. Pretty comfy as well. It's spongy. These windows go all the way down so you can do a bit of this. Pockets on the back of the seats. Uh, little tiny pockets here which will fit a bottle of water and these seats will fold 60-40 split as well. Yeah, and that's that's about it back here. Hey, if you're enjoying this video, don't forget to hit that like button.
Because the 9.3 was around for 10 years, of course there was a facelift. Saab being Saab, they kind of did it in two stages. They did the interior facelift in 2007, which basically got rid of all these buttons here and made it a lot simpler, at least to look at. I prefer this old button festooned dashboard because it's very much like the fighter jet ethos. Because they also got rid of the Saab information display at the top, which was like almost like a heads up display. They did simplify it and I think they probably made it easier to use and, and understand. The exterior facelift, they did that in 2008, and that was a huge revamp actually. It completely sort of redid the front end of the car. Even, even the bonnet itself became this like clamshell bonnet uh, and this big angry Saab face on the front. It did look more striking and more interesting, but it lost the, what I think about the, the looks of the 9.3, which was this sort of like very subtle, solid, modern, quite a handsome design. I did like the facelift as well, to be fair. Also in 2008, Saab introduced the Turbo X, the high-spec all-wheel drive 9.3 with a 2.8 litre turbo V6. I wouldn't mind one of those. Running a Saab 9.3, or running any Saab, could be a concern to some people because the company doesn't exist anymore, so a part's hard to find and stuff, but I've never fully understood that line of thinking because it's not like BMW is still building all the parts for their old 3 Series years later. That said, of course it's an old car and parts can be harder to come by because maybe you can't go direct to Saab to buy them, but there are plenty of people around who are basically specialists or have the parts on hand, And especially because it's obviously a GM Opel Vauxhall underneath. Some of the parts to do with the engine and some of the other parts, they're, they're definitely um, affordable and you can get hold of them. And because it's a Saab, there's a huge community of people that will help you out and you'll be able to get the right bit. I mean, Bijan's a good example of an owner of one of these because essentially it's it's a car that should have gone to the scrap heap. If, if it had been a, a Vectra or a Mondeo or something, this car would be gone, but he bought it for £500 four years ago and he's done 40,000 miles in it since and it's needed like a turbocharger replacing. There's nothing really... Uh, gone wrong with it and it's been they are quite well built reliable cars he appreciates this car he likes his Saab and he's kept it on the road other cars would have been uneconomical to repair but not the Saab so yeah thank you very much Bijan for, for lending me the car something else I, I want to give Saab credit for here is I think that the design of this car has aged really well the design is 20 years old I don't feel like I'm driving it something that's that old it blends in with modern traffic even more than like my CLK which was designed the same year I think that actually looks more dated than this car now I'm on like a dual carriageway motorway type thing this is where the Saab really is at home very smoothly glides along and it's quiet and it's refined and the seats are comfortable and I can just sit here and drive like this you know it's it's just perfect long distance car and with this diesel engine okay it's not a modern diesel it doesn't get super amazing mpg but you're still going to get like mid 40s all the petrols were more like 30 30 odd apart from the, the v6 which i had which i'd be lucky if i got 30 out of that it tended to get like 20 it was a very thirsty beast when i was doing my research for this car i, I genuinely was feeling a bit sad i was i, I was honestly looking at the the, the wikipedia page for the 9.3 and it was talking about how the, the very last 40 Saabs were built um, with it in this special edition. It's like Saab knew that it was the end of the road and, but they were still sort of building this particular car. I think that it just made me think like even to the last minute before, when they knew they were going bankrupt they were still designing new versions of this car. They, they didn't really know properly that it was that it was all over until, until it was. And the automotive industry has lost a real interesting player and I'm never going to get over that. <laughs> so the Saab 9.3, it's, it's very much a quirky Saab with, with all of the sort of interesting features and things that you'd expect from a Saab, but at the same time, as a Saab should be, it's perfectly usable even today, like 20 years on from its original design. Perfectly blends in with modern traffic. There's none of those quirks that, what you would call a quirk, but is actually just really annoying. There's none of that, it's just a perfectly usable car but at the same time being, being different and interesting. So if you need a daily driver that you can cover lots of miles in, and you can find one of these in good fettle, it's been looked after, then absolutely go for it because I don't think you'll regret it. I mean, unless you're looking for something that that's like a, you know, handles really well or, you know, has a sporty, a proper sporty edge to it. If you want something that's comfortable and, and you can use every day, then this is certainly a car to look at. I'm finding the more of these reviews I do, I do the more keen I am on the, these cars from sort of maybe 2000 up till 2010-2015 so 
if you've got uh, a car like that, get in touch and um, we can get it on this channel. Massive thanks to Bijan for lending me his car, his pride and joy. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.